Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today. My name is Sarah Schaefer and I'm with Top Producer Ag Web and Farm Journal Media. And I'll be serving as your moderator today. So how today will work is I have a recording that features Peter Martin and Greg Wolf, both of Kennedy & Co, um, that they presented at the Top Producer Seminar in, this past February. And so it's about 45 minutes long, and so we'll watch the presentation, and then both Greg and Peter will be on the line to answer your questions. Um, and I'll also have a few questions for them. So during the presentation, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question comment box, and I will um, ask those of Peter and Greg once it's time for the Q&A portion. And we also have the opportunity that if you hit the raise your hand button, I can um, unmute you and you can ask your questions directly to Greg and Peter. So you have two options. So Peter has led the corporate finance practice at Kennedy & Co. since 2009, and he works with clients regarding their current and future debt and equity needs. And then Greg Wolf has been with Kennedy & Co. since 1997, and he works with farmers and ranchers um, in the financial analysis and planning and also with the development of accounting systems and benchmarking data. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and start the broadcast. So remember at any time, type in your questions um, and then Peter and Greg will join us for the Q&A portion in about 45 minutes. Uh, my name is Peter Martin. I, uh, I'm a finance consultant for Kennedy & Co. and we can talk more about that. But the, what I really want to get into is a little bit about what we're going to go through. And, and this is my colleague Greg Wolf will be up to present in a minute. He's over in the, the front of the room and, and, and again we'll be sort of tag teaming this just today. What the, the hope of this presentation is for you to come out of this with, with some idea of when you dump off a, a set of financial statements to your lender, what is it that they're really looking for? There's some obvious things that we all get that they're looking for, but what are they really drilling down into? What are the things that your lender is really keying into about your financial statements? And maybe even what are some of the things your lender really could care less about that, that they see? Obviously, the hope with this being that you'll understand your lender a little bit more. Hopefully, this, this will change the way you present some things to your lender. Certainly change the way you, you sort of verbally present to your lender. Maybe some of the things that you're going to highlight for them before you just leave those financial statements and walk. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we can make is, as borrowers from a, a lending institution is by just walking into our banker and saying, there you go, there's my package, how are the kids, let's go, okay, we'll see you in a couple weeks to sign the documents and leaving. This is becoming incredibly complex, what we're doing. Now, borrowing is a very simple thing, but what we're doing is becoming complex. And as I don't have to tell anybody in this room, it's becoming a very expensive business to be in, and the numbers are starting to get astronomical that you're having to borrow. This isn't like when you could just go in and borrow a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're talking five, 10, 20 million, and even greater numbers. They're numbers that you need to really sit down with your banker and spend some time making sure that they get. The last thing you want is to be in a loan or a borrowing situation where you and the lender both are thinking other things about the other. It's a recipe for disaster. And again, we're dealing with too big a numbers for, for lenders to be pulling your credit and you having to go str scramble to find a, a new lender. So the other thought is that we built this presentation based on knowing there was a lot of different levels of experience in borrowing money. We may have some people who are about to make their first request for money. We may have people who have been doing this for 50 years. So understand there's going to be some varying degrees there. And, and again, please, please feel free to throw out specific questions. So with that, I want to make a couple of assumptions as we go into this. What we're going to be doing is talking about some specific things about your financial statements. And we're going to avoid some fairly big, big topics along the way. Now, a couple of those things are, number one, we have focused solely on the financials. So there's a lot of other things that go into making a loan besides your financial statements, and they're incredibly important things. I, I've said for a long time that your management team and your lender's confidence in your management team is basically the equivalent level of importance to them in making a loan. Obviously, they want to know the financial support it, but they want to make sure that you and your team are the people who are going to be able to continue that financial performance over the years. So we're going to make the assumption that for today, you're all great managers, you've got great team, you're here at Top Producer, so of course you're going to be great managers. That goes without saying. 
Secondly, good character or credit score. Bottom line, it doesn't matter what I tell you or how I tell you to structure your loan or your financial package. If you've got a 500 credit score, we're not getting very far. So good credit, good character is a very important part of the borrowing process. You, you need to pay your bills on time. You need to have a, a manageable amount of debt. And if you don't have that, it's going to create some enormous obstacles along the way. So we're going to assume everybody here, great credit score. Appreciate it. Strong management team, we talked about this. The other help point I would hit home with this is if your banker has not had a chance to meet your senior management team, that's an error. You need to get them out and make sure they understand who is running this operation if something happens to you. Bankers get very, very nervous about succession planning. And what's next? If you're hit by a bus at top producer, what's going to happen to your operation and who's really going to take the reins of this thing? So make sure they're a part of that. Succession plan we covered. Industry risk, we're going to say for now, because we've, we've, we've heard that agriculture is going to be the shining star for a while, so we're going to say industry risk, we're not worried about. So bankers are really excited about your, your industry. And then again, your other risks have been, been addressed. We're going to hit this at the end again, but it's, it's worth mentioning twice. If at the end of the day, you can walk into your banker and say, these are the risks to lending my operation money, and here's how you mitigate these risks. Your lender will make you that loan at the end of the day. That's what lending is all about, is understanding the risks and figuring out if they can be reasonably mitigated and therefore a reasonable expectation of repayment can, can be considered. That's what it really comes down to. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of the, the overview of how we're going to do this. We're going to cover three sort of areas. We're going we're to start with financial analysis, which is going to talk a little about the quality of the financials, some key performance indicators, and then some benchmarking data. And my, my colleague, Greg, is, is really going to cover that section or a lot of that section. Uh, he's a, a real expert on that stuff. From there, we're going to move on to borrowing causes. This is really sort of the, the basic nuts and bolts of, of Lending 101, but it's incredibly important, and all too often it gets overlooked. But finally, we're going to end with repayment, and, and that's going to be sort of the, the bottom line about lending, is showing this, this ability to, to repay the, the loan, and we're going to talk about some different sources of repayment along the way. So let's talk about financial statement quality. There are all sorts of financial statements out there. Everything from, from your gold standard, your audit, which is, is a bit uncommon. We don't see a lot of audits coming across for, for producers, but they are out there for the really, really large guys. All the way down to the barroom bar napkin financial statement, uh, handwritten, and, and it's on the ledger that you, you've handwritten in pencil, and there's a bunch of erase marks, and maybe even a hole because you've erased so many times on, on the piece of paper. The bottom line is all financial statements that you're delivering to a lender need to have a few things in common. Number one, they need to be readable. If it's not something that's prepared by a CPA, or even if it is something that's prepared by a CPA, you need to make sure that, that anybody can pick that up and look at it and really understand what's going on, that these are a readable statement for the, for the lender. Number two, and obviously these are in no particular order, clearly they've got to be accurate. If you don't have an accurate financial statement, it doesn't matter what else we say today, that's going to be a major problem. Uh, make sure your financial statements are accurate. If you do them yourself, maybe have somebody else take a look at it. Bankers are great at looking at financial statements and helping you improve that. So if you're not using a CPA to prepare your financial statements, grab somebody else and have them, them do that. Oftentimes your banker, if you're, again, not using CPA financial statements, has a form that they'd like you to use or can at least give you a format. So take them up on that. Clearly, they need to be timely. It never ceases to amaze me how much people frustrate their bankers by not getting stuff in in a timely manner. This is one of the easiest things to do to keep your relationship solid with your banker. Just get them the stuff when you say you're going to get it to them. It, it's as simple as that. Complete and global, and this global thing is something new. This is this is really coming about after the, the credit crisis uh, over the last couple of years. Now, obviously, they want to make complete financial statements, but they really want to be a global look at all of your entities. My guess is if we survey the crowd, you all have more than one operating entity or one business entity that's got money moving in and out of it. Your bank needs to understand what are all of those liabilities that are out there. What's all of that income look like? And hopefully, you can produce a global cash flow at the end of the day that tells your banker, through everything I've got going on, here's how the money is moving around. When you've got 14 different entities and money's being moved between different entities, that's an incredibly difficult process to go through and reconcile. So if you can help your bank out and show them at the end of the day, here's what the global cash flow looks like, you're going to be a lot better off. 
Now, what we are seeing more and more of is, is obviously bankers want this global cash flow, but they also still want the detail about farm versus non-farm. So it's a good idea to not only separate out your farm versus non-farm, but then also give one sort of, at the end of the day, here's what the entire thing looks like. If you walk in with that, you're going to keep your banker pretty happy. Accrual versus cash, um, this could be an entire discussion in and of itself. What I'll say with accrual versus cash is, for the most part, it makes more sense to be on an accrual financial statement as a producer than it does a cash statement. It takes a little bit more work, it takes a little bit of discipline, and oftentimes it takes retraining your staff. But really everybody ought to be moving towards that, that accrual financial statement. And we can talk more about that at the end if, if anybody's got questions on it. Uh, borrow, prepared versus CPA, compiled, reviewed, and audited. A little bit all over the board on, on what are sort of the, the minimum standards for, maybe not minimum standards, but the, the borrowing amounts for each of these. What I'd say is if, if you're starting to borrow anything more than about 10 million bucks, you're going to need to be at this point. If we're out trying to help a producer find money, we won't even go shop for it if they're 10 million bucks unless they've got it reviewed. If you're sort of in that $5 million range, you need to start talking about these compiled financial statements. If you're borrowing less than that, again, depending on your bank, you can probably get away with a, a borrower prepared financial statement. I'll tell you this, a lot of being able to have a borrower prepared financial statement has to do with your, your lender's confidence in your ability to generate a good one. So if you're doing a lot of these things, you're going to be far better off staying on that, that financial statement, or you're going to have a better chance of staying on that financial statement, I should say. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg for a minute or two here. Thank you, Peter. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, well, my name is Greg Wolf. Like you said, I joined Kennedy & Co. about uh, this summer. I think it's been 15 years ago. Moved to Pratt, Kansas, and um, have worked with ag producers ever since. A uh, few bankers, but mostly ag producers. Uh, Peter's perspective is working more with lenders and lender relationships and financing and so forth. I work more at the producer level with producers to help them generate management information for their own purposes as well as to present to lenders. And I presented a session over in the Tomorrow's Top Producer uh, seminar that preceded this seminar. There was about 120 young producers over there. And the title of my presentation, which um, Jeannie Burnick actually chose or told me to talk on it, but it was, it was Seven Habits. Seven financial habits, I think, of highly successful producers or something like that. And so I just talked about seven habits, and one of the habits actually was the habit of financing. And then I tried to develop the idea that I wasn't talking about developing the habit of going deeper and deeper in debt all the time, but really the habit of cultivating the capital relationship, a debt relationship, cultivating a strong lender relationship. And so um, Peter thought it would be a great idea if we would tag team just a little bit on this presentation. So I'm glad for the opportunity to, to work with him a little bit on this. And we do work together on some client, some client stuff from time to time. Um, one thing I, I would like to say about this idea of cultivating the, the capital relationship, and one of the things that I say over there at the, to the top producers, is that producers need to think more in terms of leading the lender relationship rather than just being a follower. And what I meant by that is not necessarily um, taking charge or, or trying to control the lender's job, but actually stepping up to the plate in more of a leadership position in terms of, of cultivating that, that lender relationship and, in a sense, being ahead of where he wants you to go rather than always coming hat in hand, um, you know, reluctantly willing to give up information as the lender asks for it. And I came in on the tail end of uh, breakfast over there and listening to the farm show and so forth, and, and John Phipps said something there at the very end about lenders. And he used a term that, that, that kind of describes what I was thinking about. He said, traditionally, lenders have been gatekeepers for our business decisions. And that was the, and, and my idea was that in, in thinking about leading a lender relationship, it's not to do away with the idea of a lender being a gatekeeper. That's, that's an appropriate function for a lender is to be a gatekeeper. But the idea is simply being that we would not just be in a position of, of waiting for their yes or no about whether a decision is a, is a wise decision or not, but that we would actually have a good enough understanding of our own financial package and our own objectives and strategies and so forth that we're not looking at the lender purely as a gatekeeper, even though they do function in that capacity. And this kind of reiterates what Peter has already said, that um, actually Peter, Peter helped me out with this, just summarizing, you know, as it, as it relates to the lender relationship and cultivating a stronger relationship, 
if we were to just boil your responsibilities as a producer down into two areas, there's really only two things that a producer needs to be concerned about as they relate to a lender, as they cultivate a capital relationship. And the first one is just the quality of your financial package or your financial presentation. How good of a package do you have to present to a lender? That's number one. And number two is, is the quality of your management profile. In other words, as the lender looks at you, and not just the lender him or herself, but the lender, the lending institution, as they behold you as a borrower, how do they feel about your financial package, number one? And number two, what do they think of your management profile? Who are you? And do they have confidence in your ability to execute your objectives and so forth? And I've never worked uh, full-time as an ag lender, but I have worked in two different banks in an ag related to an ag lending capacity over um, one of them about 20 years ago and the other about uh, 10 years ago. And, you know, lenders, I can, I can just tell you from the lender perspective, we used to say all the time that, you know, we want to look, we want to look through the financials and we want to ask questions and all that. But, but we know when we drive into the driveway of an operation, how we're going to feel about this particular, this particular credit. And one of the reasons why is because we began to get a pretty good sense of the, of the management profile by just driving in and, and beholding what's happening in an operation. So actually, what I was going to talk about is, or what I am I was going to talk about is, or what I am going to talk about for just a little bit is, is more on the financial package side of things, not really the management profile per se, but I was just going to share some examples from some of the work that we do and some of the work that I do with producers and, and some of the reporting that they do as it relates to financial metrics or financial ratios, or what the Farm Financial Standards Council calls um, financial measures. Is everybody here familiar, at least at some level, with the Farm Financial Standards Council? I've been involved, and our firm has been involved with the Farm Financial Standards Council, and it began as a task force back in the 1980s, which is when I kind of came of age. I graduated from high school in 1986, and I thought I was just going to grow up and be a farmer with my dad. And I kind of dreamed about that as a child and so forth, and I just kind of assumed that that was going to be my career path in life. And we, have, we fell into, our farming operation fell into some difficult financial circumstances in the early 1980s. And about 1984, things changed kind of significantly, and I ended up um, going to college. I moved to California, and then I went to college, and, and I got a degree in ag economics. And, and my objective of that, at that time was to get in a position where I could work with farm families like my own to either prevent and or help correct a situation like that that they would get themselves into. And so really that's largely what, is, what has brought me to Kennedy & Co. and the work that I've done over the last um, 15 years there. Anyway, back in the 1980s, this Farm Financial Standards Task Force was formed, and it was simply an attempt to standardize financial reporting in agriculture to help prevent some of the misinformation, lack of information, and mixed up information that lenders were receiving about the position of their own producers. So I was just going to share a little bit about the Farm Financial Standards Council as it exists today as a, as a standard set of financial statements that they recommend producers provide to lenders. And they also have a standard set of what they call financial measures or financial ratios. And they're not all financial ratios. Some of them are net income numbers and so forth. And the farm financial standards ratios used to be called the sweet 16. You can see kind of behind up there, the sweet 16. They've actually expanded that number to 21. And so we use 21 of them today. And, and we actually use these. And our consulting with clients for their own management purposes as well as for lender reporting, we extensively use these. They're called the legal 21 set of financial measures today. And one of the reasons we do is because we think standardization is important. And we think lenders, as well as managers, should be thinking about standard metrics that allow you to compare your operation to other operations. Standardization. Standardization, we think, is pretty important. And the, the second aspect of, of the reason why we would use these legal 21 ratios is because we think it's very important that you use a comprehensive set of, of measures of metrics, a comprehensive set. In other words, not just focus exclusively on profitability metrics, but actually be watching your cash flow and your debt repayment capacity and your solvency ratios and so forth. 
So I'm going to go through a few of these Legal 21, and the way that I'm going to go through them is I'm just going to share you some examples from some actual live reporting that actually has some live client information, all anonymous, of course, but some reporting that we have used in a, in a lending context, in a lender package that we provide to lenders for some of our clients. And these are just examples, and I think I've got five slides, and those five slides match up with this, these five sections of the farm financial standards ratios. We've got a liquidity section, a solvency section, a profitability section, repayment capacity, and financial efficiency. I guess before we go there, I'll talk about this Kennedy and Co. Ag Intelligence model, or what we call AIM. We've actually created for a number of our clients a, a model, and right now it's within Excel. It's a spreadsheet model. It's a spreadsheet tool. And we use it in conjunction with some of the accounting development work that we're doing with some of our clients to, to help them establish a standardized uh, chart of accounts and a set of accounting processes that are standard. And out of, out of QuickBooks, which most of, our, most of our clients are still using QuickBooks, they're not using higher-end ag accounting packages. Some of them are, but not all of them are. Out of QuickBooks, after we've standardized the chart of accounts and the setup of their QuickBooks system, we are dumping data out of QuickBooks directly into this Excel, this Excel spreadsheet, which we call our AIM model, the Ag Intelligence model. What that does is it allows us to generate, or it allows our clients to generate, a very high-end set of financial statements and analysis that is standard. So, in other words, a dozen of our clients could walk into a lender, theoretically, I'm not saying this has happened, but theoretically a dozen of our clients could walk into the same lender and share their financial package and there would be almost total commonality, even though their businesses differ, there would be almost total commonality in terms of how their financial statements are presented, in terms of how they're analyzed, financial ratios and so forth. And, and we believe that the most powerful impact of this ag intelligence model is really on the management, the management decision making and the management reporting that's involved in, in their operation. But certainly their lender relationship is part of that as well, and so we include um, lender reporting in that as well. So, um, and I've got two different groups of data that I've been working with, and one, one set of data is a group of Corn Belt clients, and the other group of data is a group of High Plains clients. Kansas, Colorado, and Oklahoma, our primary historical uh, trade area. Kennedy & Co., we have eight offices in Kansas and uh, Colorado. But we've got clients in all 48 states, and we've got ag clients. We've got a, we've got a growing concentration of ag clients in the Corn Belt, so I developed a, a Corn Belt set of data as well. And I've got about uh, 20, 20 operators or so in those, in those studies. Again, some of our largest and best, because I, I wanted to develop a set of, of benchmarking data that we could consider kind of a the gold standard among Kennedy & Co. clientele, and then as we work with them and help them generate their own financial analysis, we could do some comparatives and say, here's how you compare with some of our best operators. And so what I was going to share with you here, some of these examples include a little bit of that data. And I'm not going very deep, and I'm not going to share page after page of, of benchmarking data, but I do have just a little bit that I'm going to share today. And once again, I've got five slides here, and these are just examples. These are just examples from actual client financial statements, financial packages that have been used for discussion purposes and management teams, as well as for lender presentation. And once again, back to what I said earlier and back to what Peter alluded to, every single time you interact with a banker or with a banking institution, you need to be thinking about what am I doing to strengthen their perception of, of our financial package, as well as our management profile, who we are, and, and their perception of our, our ability to deliver on our goals and our, and our business plan. The first one is simply what we call the top side of the balance sheet, their liquidity, their liquidity picture. And this, this is a live client example. And it's just these red and blue bars are just what's your current assets and current liabilities. The difference between the two, of course, is your working capital and purple. And what does the trend like, look like over time? We love pictures to tell a story about what's happening over time. Here's your five-year trend analysis. And then uh, this is one of the 21 farm financial standards ratios, and it's the one that I like best for evaluating liquidity, and that is what is your working capital as a percentage of revenue? 
And the reason I like looking at it that way is because it relates your working capital cushion or buffer in your business to, to business size. So it relates to the size of your revenue. And it also relates to your profit margin. It provides a nice comparative with your profit margin to know how buffered you are against a real downturn, maybe a loss. Um, in this particular operation, they've obviously had negative working capital in the past, and their percentage, their working capital percentage of revenue, that's the green line, has hovered around 0%, but thankfully it's climbed up above zero and it now stands about 10% or 5%, 2010 most recent year. It, it's a very graphic illustration for a, a management group or a family, whoever's managing their farm. It's a graphic illustration of what their, what their working capital position is doing over time as it relates to revenue. And obviously, we have done some consulting with this particular client to try to help them get out of negative territory in, work, in terms of working capital and up into positive territory. In this uh, particular Corn Belt study, I only had two years of data in it. I started it more recently. It took that long before I thought I had a good enough set of data, and so I've only got two years worth of numbers. But you can see that the working capital as a percentage of, of revenue is up in the 40 to 30 percent range, and there's going to be some there's going to be some chop, but I expect it to remain up in that up in that range. Uh, Mo Russell, I don't know how many of you Mo, you know Mo Russell, but he also spoke at the uh, tomorrow's top producer session. And he suggested that this number, I always use 25% as a metric. I always tell our producers that, you know, you, you ought to at least be at 25%. Working capital is a percentage of revenue. He said that you ought to be at 50%. And he said, for those of you that are farming 5,000 acres or more, you ought to be at 75. Well, last night, this economist from LaSalle said that 2012 is going to be the year of what? Not volatility. He said it's going to be the year of paralysis. You know, and if, if he's right... Maybe we don't need to be at 50 or 75, but be that as it may, none of us know. I use 25% as a target, and like I said, Mo uses uh, 50%. The next one I wanted to look at, once again, this is just an example. This is a different different operation, by the way, but these are all, I'm pulling these from some live financial reporting that we've used for management purposes as well as ended up in some lender reporting. But this is just solvency. Where are you at in terms of total assets, total liabilities, and purple, of course, owner equity. Once again, I like to use a, a five-year, three- or five-year trend analysis because it tells the story of what's been going on in the operation. There's actually a fairly significant restructuring took place for estate planning purposes and so forth. And, and they pulled some of their, their assets out of this entity and separated them into a, a, a land a partnership, essentially. So that's what happened there. That's why the total assets number comes down so much. Um, obviously, it wasn't devaluation of land or anything, but um, that gives you an idea of their equity percentage over time. It dropped. No concern there. That just involved restructuring. And so they're hovering around six, low 60% equity. The blue line up here is just the average of that, that group of High Plains operators. And once again, I provide that just to share with some of our clients. What is, how do you compare with some of what some of our larger and better operators look like? Um, the next one here, this is a different type of a, a report, obviously, and there's no graph. Um, this, is, this is actually a page from, I talked about that AIM financial model earlier, and this Excel spreadsheet that we've developed that, that provides some extensive financial analysis utilizing QuickBooks data that we dump out into an Excel format. These are the five profitability-related financial measures that the Farm Financial Standards Council recommends. And I'm not going to talk about each one. I'm just, I'm just going to say this. What we've got is not a graph, but we've got a, a six-year trend analysis. And the beauty of this is that we've actually got three historical years on this side, and then we've got three projected years. So as part of this model, we've actually got some extensive future projections and scenario planning, and so we can go into the model and we can actually change anticipated pricing and so forth and see what that does to our projected profitability measures. What does the trend look like? Yes, John. And then we've also got it coded, and once again, this coding is, is based on, 
somewhat on our uh, benchmarking data that we're doing with our clients. We've got coded for red, green, and yellow, which is not necessarily a new concept, but it's it's just to help identify what is what is urgent or or caution area, what, what's looking pretty good, green, and what's kind of um, so so. So return on farm equity, for example, I believe anything under five percent is uh, set up in the spreadsheet to uh, show up in red. Caution under five percent. From five to ten is in yellow, and anything above ten is green. Not that five percent is such a terrible number, right? But uh, we've become accustomed to better than that. Uh, repayment capacity. Once again, I've just got a slide here as an example of each of these five sections of the Farm Financial Standards uh, Council ratios. And the last one is um, financial efficiency. And I'm using I'm using actual screenshots and graphs from from some of our client work that. This contains all of the financial efficiency measures. There's actually five of them. What's your operating expense ratio? What's your interest expense ratio? Depreciation ratio? And what's your net income ratio? That's the purple up there. And we do a graph like that just to illustrate the trend of your profit margin over time. So the profit margin for that particular operator is you know, averaging in the 30% range. And that's, that's why I like to look at working capital as a percentage of revenue because we can compare your working capital position with your profit margin and get some sense of if we had a down year that looked like it did in 2006, what kind of an impact would that have on our working capital position in a year? This right here, I'm not going to spend much time with it, but it also includes, there's four measures up there, one additional one called asset turnover is in this column right here. We use asset turnover in a, in a system of analysis called DuPont analysis. It was named after the DuPont chemical company that kind of founded this style of analysis, but it basically just says this. Return on equity is actually a function of three components in any and every business. It's a function of profit margin, which we call earns. What are our earns? How efficient are we? What's our profit margin? Multiply that times our asset turnover, which we call turns. How much revenue are we generating relative to our asset base? That gives us return on assets. And then we take return on assets and multiply it by our equity multiplier, which is the inverse of our equity percentage. It's just a measure of how leveraged are we to get to return on equity. So we, we can have 10 different operations in the same room that all have the same return on equity, but a couple of them got there through profit margins. High profit margins. A couple of them got there through a higher asset turnover ratio, and some are just extremely highly leveraged, which infers additional risk and so forth. So we just like to understand how is it that our return on equity is high. Uh, we're going to move right into uh, borrowing causes, and, and borrowing causes seem like they should be a pretty straightforward thing, but there can, can be some nuances to it that sort of mess with that a little bit. Bottom line with borrowing causes is why are you asking for money? And they can be boiled down to just a few different borrowing causes that make up 99.9% .9 of all reasons anybody borrows any sort of money out there. Really, your causes come down to, to these right here. First is increase in current assets. There's, there's sort of a sales process that happens here, or, or a cash conversion cycle that happens here. Your current assets go up because your receivables go up. You, you've sold your grain, you've sold whatever, and you've, you've, again, created a higher receivables balance. Well, now you've got to convert that to cash. And so you may have to borrow money to fund that conversion process. And again, that typically comes out of, out of sales growth. The other side, though, is if you're having difficulty converting those current assets to cash. If you're not collecting on your receivables in a timely manner, you're probably going to have to go borrow some money because you're not getting that cash in the door in, in a timely fashion. So that can also be a very big cause or, 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 or common cause of, of an increase in current assets. A change in your payables. If, if all of a sudden the people that you're buying things from say, you know what, we were on, on net 30, you could pay us 30 days later or 45 days later, but now we're saying we need to pay it at the time of the purchase. That's going to mess with your cash flow quite a bit. So you may have to go out and borrow money because of the, the change in payables. Of course, purchase fixed assets. If we want to go buy the, the green paint, the new stuff, we've got to go out and buy this stuff with, with typically borrowed funds. We're fortunate enough, we might have cash, but more than, more than not, and more often than not, we're going to have to go out and borrow money. And then finally is a decrease in net worth, and I want to talk about this one a little bit more in a second. And that can happen because of a couple of reasons. I'd say that the more common ones for, for, for agriculture are if there were losses. you got to fund those cash losses somehow, and so you oftentimes borrow money to, to do that. Or dividends, and dividends is one that your lender really loves to see when you're borrowing money to go pay dividends. That'll make them real happy. So, 
uh, purchase treasury stock and fraud. We're, we're not going to get too much into to those today. So let's talk about really the four types of credit facilities that are out there. And again, 99.9% .9 of the time, this is going to cover everything. Your seasonal line of credit, pretty common to, to most of the people in this room. You're borrowing on a line of credit to pay for all your inputs. Once you're able to convert that crop into cash, you pay back that line and, and hopefully it pays itself down to, to zero. Typically caused by, again, an increase in current assets. Those receivables go up, you have to pay all your input costs, and now you convert it to cash, and we're able to pay back our line of credit. Again, due to sales growth or, or conversion difficulties. This can also occur if trade terms happen, just like we talked. All of a sudden, the person you're buying things from says, I need payment today. You may need a bigger line of credit in order to accommodate that. Uh, we'll move on to the, the permanent capital line. The permanent capital line is, is really, it's when your seasonal line is no longer resting. It's no longer zeroing out. And instead, you really need that money for some period of time. And often, this is for, for years. This may be a line of credit that never goes down to, to, to zero. Again, caused by your increase in current assets there, uh, sales growth, conversion difficulties, all the stuff we talked before. But the one you see oftentimes here is a decrease in net worth due to losses or dividends. Losses are probably the, the big one. This is what we see more often than not when we're talking to a producer who says, for some reason my line of credit is not big enough. It's not meeting my needs, but my lender tells me that that's a big enough line of credit for what I'm doing. What we tend to find more often than not when we really get in there and analyze it is they're financing losses, previous year's losses on that line of credit. You don't want to do that. If your seasonal line of credit has stagnant debt sitting out there that is not getting paid back by that year's crop cycle, we need to get that off of your line of credit and free your line of credit up for operating purposes. That kind of debt needs to be paid off using profits from your business, and we'll get to that in, in, in a minute. Uh, bridge loan, I'm not going to talk too much about. Term loan, if you're going to go out and buy, again, the new tractor, you're going to use a term loan to do that. We do see once in a while people using their line of credit because it's just real convenient to go out and buy those things. Again, that's really not what your line of credit was designed for. It's not how the repayment is set up on this thing. So if you're buying fixed assets, that needs to be in some sort of a, a term facility or, or maybe a bridge loan in, in certain circumstances. Let's go into repayment because this is what I really want to make sure we get to. Repayment is obviously the bottom line of a loan. What any lender has got to do is they've got to be able to show without much uncertainty you are going to repay your loan. Most lenders' models allow for about 2% on the low side, maybe 5% on the high side of their loans to go bad. If any more than that go bad, their whole model gets really screwed up really fast. And we go back to 2008, 2009, 2010 when banks were failing all the time. A couple of things that we want to focus on when you're talking to your lenders and you want to hit hot home and your financial statements. Primary source repayment, secondary source repayment, and then potentially a tertiary source repayment. Primary source repayment is going to be based on borrowing costs, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Your secondary sources of repayment tend to be from things like outside income, your non-farm income if family members do. If you have a good net worth, that may be your secondary source of repayment. If you could sell excess assets off, that can be a form of a secondary source repayment. What you're saying here is if all of a sudden what I thought was going to happen this year doesn't happen, here, Mr. Lender, is how I'm going to repay you. Here's my second way of paying back the, the loans I have. Finally, we get into the tertiary sources, and this is where we start having problems, because now we're just talking about liquidating things to get the lender paid back at, at all costs. We're talking about exercising guarantees at that point, which is never a good thing. And then the joke, because I actually saw this in a lender presentation once, was refinance the dumber lender. That's where your lender says, who's the bigger idiot I can go find to refinance this thing, because I don't want it anymore, because we're not going to get repaid. The primary sources of repayment, again, based on the type of borrowing need that you have or borrowing cause you have. On your seasonal line of credit, we talk about that you're paying it back with a conversion of current assets to cash. We're going to go market our grain, and, and based on that money that we receive for that, we're going to go back and pay back our, our note. The bank analysis at this place, or at this point, is going to be really focused on what are the risks to that conversion happening? What are the things that could get in, in the way of you being able to convert those receivables into to cash? We're going to be focused on the inventory quality. What's our access as a lender to that inventory if there was some sort of a problem? 
how reliant are they on a certain type of inventory or a certain crop? Uh, on the manufacturing side, you get into some other things here. Uh, perishability is, is not generally an issue. And then finally, liquidation value. If I'm a lender and I have to go out and just liquidate this, what's it worth to me? Now, in, in our industry, it's a little difficult. If the lender has to come in and do something, they got to come in and finish growing that crop. So there's a little bit of risk there for the lenders. But they get that, and they're, they're continuing to lend, obviously. I also focused on your AR mix. Are you selling to just one customer or are you selling to 50 customers? Do we have any sort of a risk of a concentration where if one of your customers no longer wants to buy grain from you, that, that you're not going to be able to get that grain sold? Um, we'll talk a little bit if we have some time about the, the marketing plans and your risk management programs. That's a pretty important part as, as well to cover on payments. But for your seasonal line, just know again, it's based on, on your need to finance this, this uh, increase in current assets. And again, maybe focus more sort of on the balance sheet and what are the risks to repayment on that line. Permanent working capital, that stagnant debt. Now we're talking about you're repaying that from your profits. You're no longer repaying it by being able to go out and sell all your grain. You're being able to repay it by what's the leftover profit at the end of the day? What's the extra I had to go pay back this stagnant debt from losses two and three years ago? Again, you don't want that money on your line of credit. You want to put that into some sort of a term facility or a permanent working capital loan so that you can, you can pull those profits out, really start paying that debt down, and get your seasonal line back into a place where it, it belongs. Focused here on, on your projections. Are you, pro, are you showing projections that, that, that have a, a significant amount of profit on them? Enough profit that's going to be able to pay back the, the, the loan that you're going to need to take out for your losses. Are you able to leverage assets if you need to anymore? And how sustainable is your operation and your plan and your management team? Is this the right team to get us to where we want to go and, and to get the profits that we're going to need to get? Term loan. You're in profits from operation. If you want to buy new equipment, you buy it and you pay for it using the profitability of your operation. After you've paid all the bills, I've got this much money left, that's plenty to repay the note that I have from the bank for, for the new green paint. Your bank analysis here, again, income statement focused. It's cash flow. It's ultimately about cash flow. Were you able to generate enough cash flow at the end of the day to pay back the minimum payments on your loan or even additional payments on your loan? Uh, typically right now, the sort of the gold standard is 125 to 1, meaning you have a dollar 25 in free cash flow at the end of the day to service every dollar worth of debt that you have outstanding. That's typically the gold standard. Runs anywhere from about 115 to maybe 135, 140, depending on your, your lending institution. Uh, again, really focus on these projections. Part of the projections in this situation is we want to do some sensitivity analysis. What happens if all of a sudden interest rates were to go up? What happens if corn prices were to go down on us? In those projections, you want to run some what-if scenarios to say, is my operation still going to be able to generate sufficient cash flow with these different outcomes that, that may occur? So please take a little bit of time and sensitize those expenses, those income items that could adjust on you and that could have a significant impact on your cash flow. Again, we talked about it earlier, very, very important to have your, your lender's confidence in your management team, that these are the right people to make this happen with or without you as a part of it. Uh, collateral analysis, of course, we're still focused on if the bank has to come in and take that collateral, that new piece of equipment, because you weren't able to pay it from your primary source repayment, uh, is that collateral really worth something? If I'm going to lend you a million dollars, I sure hope that collateral is worth a million three, a million five, whatever the magic number is. Bridge loan, uh, for time, I'm going to skip for now. Um, really just understand the bridge loans. You re with a bridge loan, it's a temporary solution. You're looking to refinance it to a, a, a real permanent loan down the road. Um, really what we're focused on is, is that going to be able to be refinanced at some time in the, in the future? Secondary sources of repayment, um, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but this is really focused on your outside income, non-farm -on income. If you are working somewhere else, if you own rental properties, if you have some investment income or a large trust, that's what you're really going to focus on. As a lender, that now gives me my second option. If our primary source of repayment, the sale of crops and, and the, the typical operating cash flow doesn't come through, what do I have to rely on to repay my note? The stronger this is, the more likely, obviously, you're going to get the loan that you're looking for. 
part of that analysis then is, is this, this outside income going to be sufficient for repay, repayment and is it sustainable? Is this a job you've had for, for five years or is this a job that off the farm you've had for 20 years? Makes a little bit of a difference in my analysis of do I believe that that's going to be there when it comes time to, to pay the bills. Second source of, 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 of a secondary source of income, if I can say that, is the net worth of the company. If you've got a company that's got a lot of cash in the balance sheet, Greg was talking about having all of this, this liquidity sitting out there. If you've got a bunch of cash on the balance sheet that you can use and a, and a strong net worth that you can use to repay your note, your lender can rely on this. Maybe now you don't have any non-farm income, but again, you have this strong liquid net worth on your balance sheet that you're able to go out and, and, and either leverage or, or liquidate some things or, or just hand over the, the cash. A um, couple of key things you got to look at is discounts for tax. Are you going to have to pay tax to, to use any of this money? Are there going to be fees to sell any of the things you may have to sell? Are you going to have to go out and fire sale these things? Is the value going to be significantly reduced when it comes time to liquidate them? And then finally is, what's the impact on the company going to be if we have to start liquidating assets? Can the company still operate? Tertiary social repayment, again, this is where we're starting to get really worried. If, if as a lender we're starting to rely on this kind of a repayment, we're talking about a workout loan. We're talking about a loan that the attorneys are starting to get involved with. Uh, we're liquidating assets, and at this point, we don't care what impact they have on the business. The only thing that we care about now is we're getting our loan repaid at, at all costs. So we're looking at the quality of the collateral. What can we liquidate? How fast can we, we, can we liquidate it? What's the value of that collateral going to be? At this point, we probably are talking about a fire sale. This is, uh, we're going we're gonna to basically foreclose on the assets, and we're going to be able to get them liquidated to, to pay back at least as much of our loan as we can. Who's got control of the collateral? That tends to be a big issue at this point. Does the lender have the ability to go get the assets that they need and, and take them and, and go liquidate them? You also can move into utilization of guarantees. My guess is if we again survey the crowd here, I'd say probably 99% of the people, maybe 95% of the people in this room are guaranteeing their notes personally. Uh, this is when we start talking about exercising those guarantees. What typically happens is the lender, if they get to this point, they're going to start looking at all the balance sheets and, and, and income statements of the individual guarantors. And they're going after the deepest pockets first and the most liquid pockets first. So if you're a guarantor on a note, even if you are a minority owner in an operation, as long as the loan is structured that way, they're going to go after you first if you've got the deepest pockets and the most liquid pockets. So looking at the guarantor's ability to service that debt, maybe they don't have the cash to pay it off, but they've got outside income. It's a guarantor who's a minority owner, and they've got some great job in the city somewhere. They're going to go for look, up, look to that person to, to service that. And then your guarantor's contingent liabilities. This goes back to our discussion earlier about global cash flow in a global scenario. What are those other liabilities out there, maybe not with this particular bank, but that are going to be affecting your ability to service debt and your overall leverage that you've, you've got in your balance sheet? A couple of final thoughts on here, and then we'll turn it into some questions. Uh, I said it earlier, again, I want to hit it again, is, is, is risk, risks and mitigants. At the end of the day, your lender is trying to understand what are the risks to this operation? What are the risks to the loan I'm going to make? And they've got to go back to their credit committee or their credit approver and say, I've identified the risks. Here's how I am mitigating those risks. If you can help your lender identify risks and mitigate the risks, you're going to make their job a lot easier, and your chances of being approved are, are exponentially higher. Consider what I would call a workout roadmap. This is something that uh, essentially you sit down with your lender and say, let's discuss if something were to happen to my business, how am I going to repay you? And let's build a blueprint today to say these are the steps that are going to be taken if something were to go south in my operation. The federal government, after the, uh, the credit crisis, has basically made all of the large banks go out and do this to themselves to say, how are we going to unwind our businesses if something were to happen? So you might consider that. Keep it in the back of your mind. If my business starts going south, if corn prices fall to this, if I have some other issue come up, what am I going to do? How am I going to repay everybody? That will give your lender a lot of confidence in you. Involve your advisors, and I've, I've had this conversation probably 10 times over the last couple of days. Uh, I said it earlier, this is an incredibly complex business now, and we're talking about huge, huge sums of money. Keep your advisors involved with this. Have your lender meet your, your accountant and your, your, your marketing group. These are the people who can help really tell your story and instill a lot of confidence in your lender. Don't go into your lender by yourself and, and, and not bring a team along with you. They all need to get together, and I, I promise you, 
will have a good outcome for you. Talk about it before, deliver your financials on time, sensitize your projections, run those scenarios of what happens if corn prices drop or expenses rise. It's pretty shocking to see how big of an effect that can have on your operation. And I can tell you your, your lender is doing that, and, and so you know what they're looking at and be prepared to answer their questions about repayment. And, and again, involve your lender and, and their team. Lenders don't make decisions by themselves. There's committees involved. There's approval processes involved. Find out what your lender's approval process looks like and make sure those approvers understand you and your operation. Get them out to see your farm and meet your team. It's important, especially as lenders are starting to move around more often, that other people are to move around more often, that other people at your bank know who you are and what you're about. All right. Well, that concludes the uh, recorded portion of our webinar. So, Greg and Peter, are you on the line? Yes, Mr. Peter, right here. All right, great. All right, well, um, for our attendees, you can type the questions in the question comment box. Um, so I'll go ahead and get it started with some questions. Um, you mentioned that it's a good idea to let your lender know what kind of risk you are. Um, as a customer, and I was wondering if you could give us an example of what a risk would be that you should share with your lender. I think there's a there's a number of, of different risks that, that you might uh, discuss with your lender. I think these are all going to be things that you as a, as a business owner are thinking about yourself every day. Uh, examples of these uh, might be corn price fluctuation. Uh, they could be uh, changes in expense cost, if your fertilizer costs, if you anticipate that going up quite a bit. Um, these are all factors that are going to, to change your, your sort of projections and maybe deviate from your projections. And so I think these are things that you ought to give your lender some, some awareness of. There's a risk uh, to you that your expenses could change drastically, and therefore that is a risk to your lender as well. Um, so I think it's good to identify those risks and, and let them know that up front. Um, Another area that tends to be a pretty common risk, and, and uh, uh, unfortunately we've seen some recent examples of this, are concentrations in terms of who you sell your, your commodities to um, or even who you do your hedging and risk management through. Um, MF Global was a perfect example of having these concentrations and how that can create a very, very large risk to producers. Uh, and, and so I think that's another area where you can identify a risk to your, your, your bank and say, we realize that's a risk. Here are the steps we are taking to, to mitigate that. Great. All right. Well, a question that we have is um, you mentioned that, you know, lenders don't make decisions on their own, and it's also important for your CPA to understand your financials. Um, who else should you let review your financial statements that could maybe help you get those in better shape or help you or offer you some good insight or critique about your financial situation? Sure. One of the, one of the groups that's really popped up a lot, and both Greg and I have had uh, quite a bit of interaction with, with these types of setups, uh, is, is the producers going for more of a board of directors or an advisory board is maybe a better way to say it. Uh, this would be a group of people uh, that are, are really sort of uh, people you respect the opinion of, who can maybe bring an outside opinion, maybe bring a different skill set to the table. Uh, and we have run into some situations with producers where they are using this advisory board to walk through their financials. Um, that may be made up of your, your CPA. Maybe there's an attorney on that board. Uh, we've seen bankers on those boards. Uh, maybe it's just a, a, a sort of a a mentor, if you will, somebody who you know in the business that's been very successful that you really trust and respect their opinion. Um, those are some good examples of, of people who can offer sometimes some, some good insight into to, to each financials and, and, and all aspects of your business for, for that matter. Greg, do you have any other uh, thoughts on who else should look yeah, at financials? Yeah, you, you, you covered it pretty well. My first thought went to some of the management advisory boards that we've helped clients set up. That's more of an internal an internal way to bounce off your financials with somebody quasi internally, but I was also thinking more broadly about just the, the growing movement in ag production toward peer group organizations, and basically it's the same functionality that Peter already spoke of, but it's just it's just interacting with a group of peers in ag production and even bouncing financials, your own financials off of them, and even doing some SWOT analysis of, of your financial package 
you know, what, what am I really weak in and what are we really, really strong at? Great. All right. Well, Greg, this might be a good question for you. Um, since you spoke with the Tomorrow's Top Producer Group, um, so what kind of financial goals in terms of debt or savings or loans should a young farmer set early in his or her career? Well, that, that's a great question, and, you know, the consultant answer is always, it depends. Right. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to be flippant about that, but um, some of it boils down to exactly what, what are our, our producer's objectives in terms of growth and so forth. And, for, for example, there's kind of a why in the road that meets every farm producer, whether they're young or whether they're older, further along in their career, and that is, where do I want to be at with, with regards to land ownership? And... You know, it's not always a given um, that a producer would want to accumulate much land in the course of their farming career. Now, it may be. I, I happen to believe that those are two different decisions, ag operations and land ownership, that are not necessarily synonymous. So I think it is important that a, that a young producer think strategically about what are my objectives. Do I want to be a landowner, first of all, or do I want to acquire more rented land? So that might be just an objective there. I'm, I'm not giving you any, any quantification of it, but that might be a good objective. It's just to nail down, you know, what, are, what what's my objective in terms of do I want to accumulate a lot of land ownership or do I want to just establish a base of land ownership and, and build a rented operation from there? And a lot of that depends on how much equity is already in the operation, perhaps even inheritance and so forth. Great. C certainly, I think other goals in terms of profitability, I think it's, it's very easy to target some profitability goals that are above and beyond, say, for example, the S&P 500 stock market returns. I think it provides a nice comparative benchmark as we think about growing our capital position in agriculture to, to have a target of exceeding the S&P 500. And how far we need to exceed it, I don't know, but I certainly think we ought to be exceeding that rate of return in our own operation. Great. All right. Well, Peter, I know I heard you speak a couple years ago at the Top Producer Seminar, right when the economy was really crashing and banks were going out of business like crazy. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of give an update on the current health of the banking industry and if you expect to see um, loosening or tightening of the credit requirements and just the general requirements to uh, bank in the farming industry. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great uh, great comment and question. Um, there's been a a fairly drastic turnaround in the last uh, oh, especially 12 months uh, for banks. Most banks, generally speaking, are doing much much better than they were several years ago. We still have a a sizable problem bank list in this this country. We are still going to see bank failures, and and frankly, need to see some of those banks shut down. Um, that's going to still take a, a number of months or, or maybe even a couple of years to unwind all those and, and, and get them um, get them sort of off that problem list and, and either merged or shut down altogether. But all in all, banks are doing much better. Uh, the, the, the reports of the quarterly banking profiles that are coming out and the call reports that are coming out are showing some really good improvement uh, across primarily, uh, well, all banks, but by primarily ag banks. Ag banks are really doing well and, and showing some pretty impressive uh, financial statements and, and financial performance. So I would say there is a, a tremendous amount of interest from all lenders, uh, but particularly those focused on agriculture, on, on growing their loan portfolios. I think as a good ag producer, you are in a great situation in terms of uh, being able to shop your debt around and get the best rates and the best terms that are out there. Um, for the most part, the producers that, that uh, um, have been progressive and, and have, have um, run good operations over the past couple of years, they're showing strong financial performance, and banks realize that. So banks are hungry to bring, bring those kinds of loans uh, onto, onto their balance sheet. Um, there, there are great banks in sort of all size spectrums. There are great banks on the small end, and there are some great banks on the large end and everything in between. And I would encourage producers to go go meet with some different banks. Um, don't stick with the same bank just because you've always been with them. It, it's 
it's nice to have a backup plan in place. We learned that a few years ago, how important that was if your bank started having problems. So entertain that call from the, the, from the banker who keeps coming by to see you and, and, and talk to them, see what they have to offer. Uh, again, it, it, whether it's a small bank or a large bank, uh, um, there's some, some value in sitting down and talking to some, some alternatives. Great. All right. Well, this is last call for questions from our attendees. Um, I have one more, and then we'll see if any more come in. Um, you all both have touched on how farming has seen, has generated a lot of wealth in the past few years. And I was wondering if you all could pro provide some suggestions on how farmers can take this wealth and record income they've received and use it to help strengthen their balance sheets overall. Greg, you want to start with that? I think we both probably well, have thoughts there. Yeah, there's a lot of things that could be said. Obviously, the land ownership um, comes back into play, and, and I, I regard that as, as an investment decision that's, that's somewhat, somewhat separate from farm operations, but nevertheless, that is, that is a question that comes up, and it's a good one, and how much, can I, how much could I, should I, would I pay to invest in land ownership? Another thing that I'm, I, I'm by nature cautious, and I, I I alluded to it in the webinar that I, I experienced some of the farm crisis of the 80s as a boy, as a young man, and that probably affects me to this day. But I am big about increasing working capital and using this as a time to strengthen our balance sheet from a working capital perspective before we think about taking excess funds or excess profits and, and plowing it into land ownership and, and remaining very tight and constrained in terms of working capital because we do believe that this, we're, in, we're still in commodity agriculture, and we do believe that this cycle is going to turn. And we need to think about preparing ourselves for the day when corn does go to $4 again and what that looks like to our bottom line and how long we can withstand that. So I'm, I'm probably fairly defensive, and I like to think about using profits to build our working capital position more than just going willy-nilly into the land market. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with, with Greg. I think... Uh, this is all industries. This isn't necessarily just agriculture, but during the good times, you've got to be able to recognize that there's going to be some bad times again. And when you think back to the 80s and to the previous decades, ag crises, uh, what's gotten producers through it is cash and equity. Uh, and if you've got those two things, you're going to survive most of the, the big issues that are going to come before you. Uh, it's pretty tough as a producer or as any type of business owner to have cash on the balance sheet when you're not getting paid anything for it by putting it in banks or, or in, in, in safe, uh, safe investment vehicles. Um, that said, you've got to look beyond that return and realize that cash gives you the opportunity to be a lot more strategic and act fast when good opportunities come before you. I think it, it's great for, for increase, increasing your working capital, and I think that's critical, but even if you want to just, just get more aggressive during the, the, the tougher times, it's going to give you the, the, the balance sheet and the access to cash that you need to make those, those quick acquisitions and, 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 and build what you want to build. Um, the, the people who really survive and thrive during these tough times, no matter what industry they are, they're in, are the people who have the cash and the access to cash uh, to really be able to take advantage of those times. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing, I understand, to think about stockpiling cash right now, uh, but this is the perfect time to be doing that. And, and, and just you're going to have to live with the fact you're not going to get paid a lot on it, but it's going to pay off in, in the long run for you. Great. All right, well, I don't see any other questions right now. So Peter and Greg, thank you so much for uh, providing us some excellent answers to the questions today. And you're welcome. With that, this concludes um, this webinar, so thank you everyone for attending.